Hello, welcome everybody. Today we have Dr. Khaled El Shirbani, who's going to be talking to us about Egypt through the spiral lens. Um, he is the founder and chairman of Enneagram Egypt. He is also the founder, co-founder of the Consciousness Academy. He has a PhD in mechanical and aerospace engineering, a master in environmental sciences, an MBA in technology and innovation management. And he's currently finishing his master's in transpersonal psychology. And he has a spiral dynamics, uh, he is a spiral dynamics accredited professional, a certified life coach. Master, a Reiki master and a systemic constellations practitioner. So an incredibly well-rounded individual and teacher. We're very happy to have him here. It's the second time he's with us. He was here once before doing a presentation for us about the Enneagram. So he's going to explain to us a little about Egyptian society um, through the spiral and how it has evolved over the last 150 years. And with that, I hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica, so much. And it's so lovely to be back with you all here. I really love this platform and this group that you created and all the lovely sessions that are done here. And I chose today to be with you and to give uh, uh, what I would consider a light presentation. So it's more of, I will give a brief look into Egypt as it has developed over the spiral, especially in the last 150 years. But I will have to go a bit back. I mean, Egypt is so ancient that uh, we have to build on some historic stuff to understand it well in the last 150 years. Uh, and I will try not to make it too long so that I can open the floor for discussions. Since in such topics, there is no right and wrong. There are just perspectives. We don't, I don't think we have enough tools yet to say, yes, it's definitely like this. And I'm usually astonished when people are, are, are fighting about, no, this is red, no, this is blue, no, this is orange. I think it's much more complex than that. So we'll take a brief look into this, hopefully like half an hour presentation, and then we can talk and discuss with each other after that. So a brief analysis of Egypt through spiral dynamics. I, find these, I found these nice spiral pyramids inspired by Veronica on the web. So they're not mine, but I, I thought that they fit the, the start of this presentation very well. And let me say all the pictures, I used lots of pictures in the presentation. They are all taken off google and youtube so i own none of them so i hope i'm not infringing on anyone's property and they are as close as possible to representing what i wanted to tell today so let's take a very ancient look at egypt so that we understand egypt today now, now this is egypt briefly represented uh, caricaturally represented in the ancient times and we always talk about upper egypt and lower egypt and as you can see it's very confusing it's always confused me. I have to think about it for a couple of minutes because Upper Egypt is down in the south and Lower Egypt is up in the north. And when you realize that the earth is a globe floating around in space, you realize that this is just our current convention about north and south. So when you look into the, into the Arabian maps five, six hundred years ago, you find that Africa is up and it, and Europe is actually down and it's very confusing for a while, but then you realize it's just everyone putting themselves on top. But uh, why is it upper and lower Egypt like this? Lower Egypt is actually the Nile flows from the south to the north. So that's why upper Egypt is actually higher with the water flowing to the lower side in the north. Now, what significance does that have to do with our presentation? Am I just saying stuff no it actually has a big big impact it's because of this while at the same time all the wind year round in egypt comes from the north to the south so you have the winds prevailing from the north to the south and the water running from the south to the north which means that it was always very easy for egyptians to flow up and down the Nile any time of the year. And it is this easy flow up and down that allowed the Egyptians to actually spread their civilization all over the Nile Valley, which created in a very early time, many, many, many villages all over the Nile Valley. So the valley was full of villages. 
unlike Mesopotamia, which was built on huge cities that are centralized, and once the city is conquered by another nation, we don't hear about them again. So you get the Sumerians, and then they fall, and then you get the Babylonians, and then they fall, and then you Akkadians, and then they fall. The ancient Egyptians, even when they were taken over by any other force, they would remain in the villages and eventually gather themselves and build back their civilization again. They didn't have these huge establishments where the center of power was. But that also from a spiral perspective means that the purple energy dominated the Egyptian culture for millennia. Thousands of years, Egypt was a purple society ruled by a red elite. So when we think of ancient Egypt, this is the picture that comes to our mind. Ancient Egypt, the pharaohs, the might, the forces. Well, this was just the tip of the iceberg, the top of the pyramid. But Egypt was always in some kind of a feudal system where this ruling elite, the pharaohs and the soldiers and the government officials would be purple, mostly red, with some purple and maybe trying to discover blue, but it was too early for blue to come in. So it was like a, a red system governing a purely purple society. So though we would think Egypt looks like this, actually ancient Egypt looked exactly like this. Now, of course, they didn't have metal pots. That's what I was saying. I did the best with the pictures. But the metal pots came with the Hittites, the Hittitians, the Haitiyin, in around one millennia BCE. But before that, they used to use bronze and other stuff. Anyway, this is how Egypt looked like for thousands of years, ruled by these people. Now, while this was most of the Nile Valley, Egypt had two other very significant groups, demographic groups, that also affect us until today. The Bedouins, and these are pictures from the Bedouins of St. Catherine. Today, I have lovely friends there, one of the most beautiful places to go to. Very purple tribes, small tribes, around the Sinai Peninsula. This is in St. Catherine where it is said that uh, Moses received his Ten Commandments and there's a beautiful monastery over there in the mountain. And as you can see, there's snow in the winter. So yes, this is Egypt. No one would, even Egyptians don't know that we have this sometimes. It's very hard when this happens. So the Bedouins are all over the deserts, Sinai and the West Desert and the East Desert. And the third group are the Nubians. And actually, many modern accounts claim that today, or actually the ancient Egyptians, were mostly the Nubians. So it's the Nubians that took over northern Egypt and would control. And every time northern Egypt or lower Egypt would be taken over by the forces coming from the Middle East, it was the Nubian forces in the south that would come back again and regain the, the rise once again of the Egyptian civilization. It is maybe the only civilization that flourished, spent like a thousand years, one of the greatest civilizations, then collapsed, then disappeared for a few hundred years, then rose again like a phoenix from the ashes, spent another hundreds of years, almost a thousand, then collapsed, then disappeared, then rose again for a third time. And this is what we call the old kingdom, the middle kingdom and the new kingdom. Now, looking at these three kingdoms, you can really, from a spiral perspective, see the move from pure purple with a little bit of red to very reddish to red with the signs of blue coming in. But again, that's ancient, we're not gonna go there. It was like a few hundred years before the common era, when the Greeks came in and Hellenistic uh, Egypt started by Alexander the Great in the fourth century BCE. And then the Ptolemy, his main leader came in, took over the country. And for almost 2000 years, Egyptians didn't rule themselves. Egyptians were 
just watching things unfold. Egyptians were just like this. Rulers would come, rulers would go. The Greeks, the Greeks fell to the Romans. After the Romans came the Islamic conquest. After the Islamic conquest came many Islamic dynasties from the Umayyads to the Abbasis to the Fatimis. And then we had the Mamluks took over Egypt for a while, the warriors coming from Eastern Europe. And then finally we had the Ottomans. Almost 2000 years of Egypt being ruled while Egyptians looked like this. There are very interesting accounts in history of these Mamluks down here on the left, fighting in the streets of Cairo over who is to rule Egypt. So two different fractions of Mamluks who were not Egyptians, fighting over who will rule Egypt. And the Egyptian peasants would just take their food and they get a sign that the, Egypt, that the Mamluks are fighting in East Cairo. So they just take the roads out of West Cairo so that they can go and sell their products and keep on going with their life. They had nothing to do with this. And uh, these are very interesting account, which shows how the culture remained very purple. And one of the effects this has until today is that Egyptians until today are considered a very peaceful and kind nation. Even in our, in our revolutions, they're never too bloody. And that is because of these thousands, in my opinion, these thousands of years of this very peaceful, purple way of living that is just about being together and going on. There wasn't really much fighting in the Egyptian blood was always just dominated over the last 2000 years by those who came to rule Egypt. Then came this person. We start now the last 150 years. Then came this person. This is Muhammad Ali Basha. He was an Albanian in the Ottoman Empire, a very red personality, a type eight. So very dominant, very powerful, very red and he started establishing what we call today the modern Egyptian nation. He got rid of the Mamluks. He took autonomous power from the Ottomans who were becoming much weaker. Actually, at one point, he almost took over the Ottoman Empire. It was the English and French who stopped him. And then he created a very strong, modern, bluish system. Now, the importance of Muhammad Ali will become very evident when we reach the 2011 uh, revolution, which is like 180 years from where we are today. So he was that significant that he saved the Egyptian nation that far by creating an extremely powerful blue system, a bureaucratic system, a self-evolving system that was holding itself, education, economy, even he started some industries. And I believe with time he was moving even in towards the orange, although he himself was centered around the red, but he allowed in the stable nation under him for this blue system to get together. He had a very strong, a very long dynasty that ended in the, in the 1950s. And the last of his lineage was King Farouk, uh, who was disposed of, deposed of in 1952 and his sister, Queen Fawzeya, who is the queen of Persia, the queen of Iran. She married the, the Shah of Iran. So at that time, these royal kingdoms in the Middle East looked very much like the royal kingdoms in Europe, with the Habsburgs uh, marrying the, from the Austria and the Spanish and the French. And it looked almost exactly the same in the Middle East here, especially the Iranian and the Egyptian powers were the strongest, and they were very close to each other at the time. Now, this is again the leading society. And I have to remind you again and again and again, and for all these thousands of years, this is how Egyptians looked like. So even until the 1940s, Egyptians were like this. And most of the villages until today are like this. But with time, with all these ruling fractions, 
red started seeping in. With the poverty and the feudal system, red actually didn't show its best side. So it appeared more in this powerful feudal system and a creating of what's called honor killing and revenge killing. And as poverty seeped in more and more to the Egyptian villages, and as pressures started happening on these very simple peasants that were living a beautiful life for these thousands of years, more and more of the negative side of red, we have to remember red has huge positive sides, but more and more of this negative side was seeping in. That did not happen to the Bedouins who are still like this until today, nor the Nubians. And the Nubians, by the way, cover from Aswan in South Sudan, all the way to North uh, in South Egypt, all the way to Northern Sudan. Now, all these would become significant in the next half of our presentation. So that is, I would call the past. By the mid fifties, this ruling elite, sorry, where is it? It's jumping around. This ruling elite had become extremely bluish and it had established a very strong bluish base in the cities. So let's look, take a look at the cities. So first of all, we had the aristocrats, and this is pictures of aristocratic Egypt from the 30s to the 60s. It looked like this, lots of palaces, and even more before that. And then we had the religious establishment, the Azhar, which was mostly very bluish, and actually a balanced, healthy bluish, with some red into it, and slight, of course, Religion is always affected by a lot of purple, I think everywhere, but it's mostly bluish with some red and purple affecting the base. But this is how it looked like. It was very stable, very steady, highly revered. The king was highly revered. The, the, the religious establishment was highly revered and even the king and the royal family highly revered the religious establishment. So this was, again, a stable system upon which the culture in the 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s looked like. This would be how the elite and the middle class would look like in, these are actual pictures from the university from, oh, so by the way, here, I wanna show something. This is actually a religious school. So this picture down here on the left is a picture from an Azhari religious school just to know that how it was, because we'll see how the transformation will happen in the last 50 years. And this is how the elite looked like. And if you would look at Iran at the same time, it would look exactly the same. So this is also how Iran would look like in the forties and the fifties and the sixties under the king, under the Shah, with the religious system. This is how the Middle East looked at that time. With most of the population, peasants. And in 1952, we had the Egyptian revolution. And in 53, Nasser seized the rule. And Nasser was a very, again, reddish blue leader who established a strong blue social system, building on the work of Muhammad Ali. Now, the problem is that Muhammad Ali's rule created a self-developing bureaucracy. So over 120 years, the bureaucracy was still very strong and very powerful and helping the country stand together and evolve. What happened with the introduction of the military rule is that this self-developing uh, system stagnated. It's like now we had the military above the bureaucracy, holding the bureaucracy in its place. And now this extremely powerful bureaucracy that was built at a time when Egypt was actually a superpower started to deteriorate. Why? Because now we have a red hand higher than the bureaucracy. If you want a good example of this, imagine now in the US, why, why imagine during Trump's time, imagine if Trump had been able to succeed to have a higher hand over 
the judicial and the executive and the the third the legislative bodies imagine now if trump had a higher hand over all of these what would happen to these three bodies they would eventually they would all serve the leader and start to deteriorate they wouldn't collapse because the us is a superpower it would take centuries to collapse like what happened to the ottomans but it would start that's what happened to egypt now we had a higher hand a red grip over the blue system but things don't collapse immediately immediately so what happened is red and purple started to seep more and more into the cities but again it still looked like this and even in the 60s 50s and 60s under nasser this is pictures from our social system, our art and our media. And Egypt at that time was considered the Hollywood of the East. And we had, I mean, it's very fascinating to look at the old Egyptian movies now and realize that they, have an, they had an Egyptian like replica for most of the famous Western actors. So Egypt had its own Marilyn Monroe, Egypt had its own uh, Kirk Douglas, Egypt had its own uh, all these famous actors, we had like replicas of them, creating almost replicas of the movies. A very, uh, what we call a very dreamy time, a very fantasy time in the media. But it wasn't like this for everyone. For most of the country was still looking like this with the red seeping in. And now is the big change. After 20 years of rule under Nasser with a socialist system that was like a big uh, police regime running a very blue establishment, when Nasser died, Sadat took over in 1970 or 1971, and Sadat had very orangish. Uh, perspectives. He wanted to modernize Egypt yet again. And he moved Egypt into an orange era. He started the move from socialism to capitalism. He opened trade, he opened commerce, he dismantled the social establishments. He allowed, he moved from the Soviet bloc, he moved to the US bloc at that time in the Cold War. And it's, it's, it's fascinating now that we know the spiral to go and see how people judged Sadat's time. So people who were ready to move into Orange took the chance, took the opportunity, and they became the industrial people, the millionaires, they become the people that really benefited from Sadat's time. While people who were still holding on to the very bluish, uh, fantasy life of the 50s and 60s considered this the time of opportunists but they say it in a negative way it's like these are the what they call them the swindlers these are the deceitful people these are the people who are not patriotic these are the people who don't do for the country they're only doing for themselves it's as if they are describing orange but in a derogatory way because they're looking at it from blue but the truth is that Sadat opened the country tremendously to orange, maybe a bit too fast. Because once that happened, now all the opportunities for growth and money moved to the city. And now you had all these peasants who were in extreme poverty in their villages moving into the cities. In 1970, Cairo had 0% slums, what I call random housing, housing that is not created by the, by the, by the municipal system. Zero, zero slums. It was one of the most beautiful cities in the world. It was, it was fabulous, as you saw from some of the previous pictures. Today, Cairo is almost 50% slums. Cairo is overrun by non-planned municipal systems. 
So what happened is a huge disturbance to the big city demographics. And it also meant a drain of farmers and peasants from the villages into the city. So neither were Egyptians anymore tending to the land in the villages. Nasser had already disturbed tremendously the agricultural system in the villages by breaking down the feudal system into a social system and giving small pieces of land to all the peasants. And then the peasants left these small pieces of land that they couldn't tend for. And they went to the cities and the land started to deteriorate. At the same time, there was too much pressure on the cities, mass migrations, and the cities were not ready for this. We have extreme crowds by the 70s. I remember it took, it used, Cairo was extremely small compared to today, yet it used to take hours just to go from one side of Cairo to the other by the early 80s, because there were too many cars, roads were not ready. This is what I call the random housing. It's not really slums in the modern city mentioned, but it's like houses that just spring out on agricultural land, even, and this is a very, very sad picture on the upper left. People couldn't find places to stay. They used to go and live in the graveyards. The graveyards started expanding. They became houses for the poor. And now we have the slums of Cairo. And in the slums of Cairo, where all the purple moved in, red dominated, and we started having gangs. But remember I told you, the Egyptians remained in them this very purplish energy. So even gangs and crime in Egypt until today is mostly dominated by what we call petty crime. So if you ever come to visit Egypt, you better take care of your wallet. You better take care of anything that you carry, but you will actually not be afraid for your life. So if you are mugged or robbed at night, no one will hurt you. They will just tell you, give me the money and they will leave you. But no one will think of killing you. No, no one is, is too much of an abstract, yes. But the, the crime rate in Egypt is very high. The high crime rate is very low. It's one of the features of Egypt. As I told you, we're not a violent people by nature. Farmers, peasants, it runs in our blood for thousands of years. So it's more of just little mugging can happen, but you have to be very careful for that. But what happens when slums like these start to, uh, to appear? Now compare this picture to this picture. This is in just 30 to 40 years. Cairo mo moved from mostly looking like this to mostly looking like this. This is over 50% of Cairo. And with this extreme crowd and extreme poverty, of course, crime, power, and anger dominated. And on the streets of Cairo today, you will realize a lot of anger. It's as if people can explode into fits of rage suddenly, which are very frightening for people who are not from Egypt. Because in other countries, as I said, it would signify that a big crime is gonna happen. But here it just ends up with, some shouting, some squaring, some swearing, and then everyone goes their own way. So there's all kinds of this power and anger dominance happening on the streets. And maybe the worst side of this happening to Cairo is the epidemic of harassment. This is definitely an epidemic in Cairo today. No woman can move around safe from harassment. And again, it's because of this demographic shift that has happened too rapid. And of course, all this came with the rise of extremist militant groups in the 80s. So if you really study well, this era and how it affected the migrations from rural to urban, you would start to understand why Cairo looks like this today. And it would actually show the reason behind the rise of these extremist groups that we're starting to see everywhere. And remember, Egypt is a huge dominant force in the Arab and Islamic world. 
And usually what happens in Egypt is like a vision of what will happen in so many other nations with just a lag of a decade or two. And that is what happened with these movements. So appearing in, a in Egypt in the 80s, by the late 90s and early 2000s, we now had these extremist groups all over the Islamic world. They were not known before the 80s, very, very little stuff. Even the brotherhood wasn't like this yet. And that even put a huge pressure on the religious establishment itself. So instead of being purely dominated by blue, it started shifting backwards to red because we started having lots of these people that migrated to the urban side, studying in Azhar and creating this terrible pressure inside Azhar between a huge red base and a blue leading fraction that is degenerating slowly and slowly. While this was happening on one side over two decades, the 70s and 80s, on the other side, the people who did benefit from the industrialization started to build a modern nation. So as if this is one path, this movement, you can consider it one branch of the Egyptian society moving in this direction, while another branch moving in a different direction. So you started having the industrialization and the elite moving into this, the new elite at least, you started having modernization with all these uh, modern establishments coming in, urbanization and the building of all these high rises and the highways and the cars everywhere. And that even by the 90s started to create a lavish lifestyle for these new elites. And this is actually from a modern, these are modern pictures from today. So this lavish lifestyle went on to get the other extreme. So we, now we have like the orange with the entire spectrum of the orange from the industrialization and the urbanization to the lavish and the consumerism and all this extreme openness and even some kind of rejection of the earlier blue and red and purple systems. Now, this was clearly growing, but slowly and steadily until these two fractions were so far apart and they created such a strong tension inside the country that the country eventually had to burst. The bubble had to go boom. And that happened in 2011 with the 2011 up to 2013 unrest, the revolutions, the unrest, the coup that happened in this time. And this was mostly led by a green power. This person down here, a very important person again in the history of modern Egypt. This is Al Baradri. He is an Egyptian peace, uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner, very greenish person, a type five. And he predicted the revolution coming and he was one of the signs of the revolution. But green cannot do a revolution. So it was built on the red masses that were oppressed and feeling that they're not getting the opportunities in the masses of the cities. And then it spread all over Egypt. So it is this green leadership of red masses that created the 2011 revolution, which deposed, uh, disposed of Hosni Mubarak, and then for two years of unrest. Remember Muhammad Ali Basha? Remember this guy? Now, what most people don't realize is that this guy here saved Egypt 200 years later. What happened in the Arab Spring? What happened is after Tunisia and Egypt started their revolutions and after the regimes started to topple, Yemen toppled, Libya toppled, Syria toppled, all these nations fell, crumbled. But what happened in Egypt? We spent almost an entire year. Now, I want you to imagine this with me. A country with the size of Egypt, almost 100 million people for an entire year, actually around 10 months, 
we didn't have a president. We didn't have a vice president. We didn't have a cabinet, no prime minister or ministers. We didn't have any uh, judicial, sorry, uh, what's it called? The parliament, we didn't have a parliament or a Senate. We didn't even have a police force. Egypt was running on autopilot with nothing on top, nothing. President, prime minister, vice president, parliament, even a police force, even the army was afraid hiding in its barracks. And the country was running like a clock. Everyone was going to work. Governmental systems were running. People were going and getting their passports done and their IDs done. Everyone was getting their salary at the end of the month. For 10 months, the country was just going on. And people don't realize that this is due to this incredibly powerful bureaucratic system that they complain about day and night. That system that Muhammad Ali built 200 years ago held the country strongly together, that blue base of the government, and allowed the country to go on until 2013, when this ex-military officer left the army and became a civilian president, but I think this picture is very beautiful in showing how he's a civilian president. So he's totally backed up by the army and the military establishment. And he himself is a very orange person, pushing at least, his, he might not, he's very bluish person, sorry, but he's pushing towards modernizing Egypt, pushing Egypt towards a very strong orange direction on the surface, but actually in the back, it is ruled by a red blue power. So it's a red blue power trying, attempting to build an orange establishment. Now you can imagine all the problems that happen with that. So if you're thinking with a blue mentality and trying to build a, a modern system, everything is still in the hands of the military. So yes, we have a modern capital being built by the establishment. We have highways everywhere owned by the establishment. Even all the businesses in the country are being owned by the establishment. So in intention, it's a magnificent idea. It's really building the modern Egypt. Now, Egyptians are starting to realize services they never dreamt of before, the e-government, Again, orange built on blue. These are things that we didn't know of before, but they're still held tightly in the hands of a red-blue establishment. So we're waiting for a movement to an orange thinking that can open this for actually a new way of running the country. And I think it's not too far away. Urbanization continued and the lavish lifestyle went on. But now with urbanization and lavishness and elites having lots of money for a long time, what eventually starts to appear in the country? The affluent living conditions open up the door to green signs coming into the country. So by the first decade of this century and more into the second decade, we started having these orange green living conditions and green started seeping in, still mostly orange, but green is seeping in. And that also went into the modern education systems that were very orangish and then started to move into a green systems, which means that the younger generation today, remember I was telling about my kids and how they are like three generations, the younger generation of the privileged segment of the society are already very greenish. I make fun of with my, my, my little kids about how the first group is, orange, is, is blue orange, the second is orange green, and the third group is greenish, very greenish. And you can imagine growing up in a red blue society, how strange they look like. Now all this in less than 40, 50 years. So after this brief look at Egypt, where does Egypt stand today? Egypt stands today 
with one half, no, one, not one half, 85 to 90% of the society between purple, purple, red, red, and red, blue. And that is the dominant force of the society. And on the other side, you have the orange to orange green to greenish segment of the society, which feels alienated from the country, but at the same time, trying to help the rest of the country grow. Now, this again is a huge tension that only God knows where it's gonna take us with the elite shifting and drifting ever further from the rest who are getting squeezed more and more in their places. Now, will they be able to create, will the elite be able to create conditions? Let's not call them elite. I call them the privileged segment of the society. Will that privileged segment of the society be able to create a growth environment for the rest of the country? Or will they fail to do that and eventually what happens is a brain drain to keep on going and a collapse of the entire system. We don't know, but that's where we stand today. So that is my brief look into Egypt on the spiral, on the long term, on the short term, and where we stand today. Great, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Fascinating. Excellent. I learned a lot. Yeah.